Good evening, my name is Kyle Hooten and thank you for tuning in to this town hall presented by Alpha News. Over the past year, America has gained a new appreciation for its healthcare workers. However, the elites in mainstream media and in DC and Hollywood would have you believe that all of these millions of healthcare workers think alike. To counter this narrative, we have brought together dozens of nurses who will participate in a town hall hosted by Representative Eric Mortensen to share their experiences on mandatory vaccinations and the progress of the COVID pandemic. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. This is gonna be awesome. Um, it takes some courage to come out here when you disagree with a very forthright and a very strong narrative. So really I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And uh, can I just give, can everybody, you give yourselves a little round of applause to kick this thing off, please. Thank you. Well, I'm Representative Eric Mortensen, and uh, we're live from my home district right here in Shakopee. And for the next 60 minutes or so, we're just going to have some conversations with nurses all around the state. And I tell you what, normally it's very difficult to put an, organ, put a, an event like this together, but I posted one post on Facebook. And I think everybody in this room knows what post I'm talking about. <laughs> There's only about 50,000 members in this, in this group. And I just said, hey, I'm working on a project. Anybody who's interested, here's my phone number. And now, uh, last time I looked, there's like 829 comments on that post. So that means there's almost 1,000 people who are interested. And I eventually had to stop saying PM sent, PM sent, because it just got to be too much. So thank you again for coming out. All right, so I think to start the night off, what we'll do is we'll just uh, kind of break the ice with some simple, you know, raising the hand questions, show of hands to kind of pe get people to know who's in this room, well, not who by name, uh, but, you know, your credibility. How long have you been in the industry? Are you working with COVID patients? So let's just do some of these quick. Uh, show of hands. Where are the nurses in the room? Because we invited more than just nurses. Okay, so it is the vast majority. That's good. So we call it the Nurse Town Hall for a reason. Uh, physicians. Any physicians? I thought we had one. No? Okay. Other healthcare professionals? Okay, the other hands go up. That's good. <laughs> so how about experience? But, uh, so who's been in their field for more than, say, five years? Okay, so a lot of hands up. Uh, more than 10 years. Pretty, okay, so there's a lot of experience here. Uh, more than 15? Okay, this is awesome. Anybody 20 plus? 20, oh yeah, okay, that's awesome. Very good. Yeah, 20 plus, for sure. 20 plus years, and now I think a lot of you are faced with... Uh, with a very difficult decision, right? Uh, how many of you are facing, show of hands, this ultimatum of get this vaccination or else you potentially lose your job? Okay. All right, so that is, I, I guess, 75, 80% of the room. So that's, that's tough. Um, and that's what, well, there are millions of people across the state, and I know you guys probably feel alone sometimes, but hopefully this room is helpful, and we certainly see these groups with 50,000 people that get started over like, Two weeks, that just goes to show there is a lot of numbers out there that are in the same position that feel the same way. But again, the media would never have you know this, right? They just want you to think, nobody thinks like you. But that's quite honestly, I feel, part of their, um, their goal is to make you feel alone. So hopefully you guys can see you're certainly not alone. Uh, who here has worked directly with COVID patients? Wow, okay. And I really didn't know the answers for those that are watching. I had no idea what to expect. Um, so that's, that's probably at least half, maybe 60%. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Well, let's kind of dive into this thing and start getting you guys, you know, your stories out there to the people across the state. So let's start off just kind of a, a high level. Um, what have the last 18 months been like for you guys? And raise your hand if you want to speak. Exhausting. Exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I talked to a nurse while he's getting the microphone. It was on her seventh day in a row of 16 hour shifts. Hi. I think uh, the last 18 months for a lot of us has been a blur. I mean, what's normal anymore? Nothing. Um, to think that we were once hailed as heroes and people that other people looked up to because of what we were doing, is, and to now suddenly we're being referred to as ignorant, uneducated, and that we're directly responsible for spreading this virus around is absolutely absurd. And what's happened in the last three months even has perpetuated that absurdity to just downright insanity. Um, 
I, I can't, it, it's disgusting that humanity has turned to this and all of this division amongst, um, you know, just good people and even coworkers. You know, we're, we're all experiencing bullying, coercion, name calling, um, segregation. It's just unacceptable. Yeah, it must be a roller coaster the last 18 months because everybody remembers it. It was, you know, our heroes, the frontline workers, you know, putting your life at risk with this virus that nobody really knew much about. Uh, of course, now we've learned a great deal about it. And um, anybody else? Yeah, Dolores. I think I would describe it as like you're drowning. Someone's holding you under, and when you come up for air, now someone's pushing you back under. Just when we catch our breath, staff start to feel a little relief, and we're seeing some improvements, and no cases in our facility now going on. 10 months, and I should knock on wood, we're being told that, oh, hey, well, let's, let's make you do this. Fortunately, my employer has not reached that point yet mm. and is backing us and is very, very supportive. Did I hear you say no cases at your facility we in 10 months? We have cases in 10 months. Wow, I certainly you never hear that. And you, wow, that, that's, <laughs> that's amazing that's that right. they're putting that pressure on. But at least they're not putting the, the ultimatum to you just, just yet. Just yet. Yeah. They have a legal team working on it to be supportive to us to find every way they can so that they don't have to issue that. And because we are long-term care, it involves Medicare, and it feels like we're being blackmailed. Hmm. Anybody else have anything to add the last 18 months? Yeah. What I find is funny is that obviously everybody agrees we were heroes this last 18 months. We went into the fire. We used PPE that was so ragged because it was used so many times. We were taping it on our face. Okay. And now we actually have PPE that we can use once and get rid of it like it was supposed to be used. And they're telling us now that we're terrorists and that we're dangerous and we're going to kill people. But yet the ultimatum doesn't come for two and a half, three months. So now, like where I work, we're at critical staffing levels. They're offering $20 an hour bonuses on top of our overtime. They're shutting down ORs because we don't have enough staff to run all the ORs that we have. So they're, they're begging us, begging us to work these extra shifts. So we're safe enough now. We're not killing patients. But as soon as a certain date comes along, we're no longer safe. It's like an right. expiration date on a carton of milk. Huh, interesting. I mean, it, it, for 18 months, you guys were on the front lines. You, I, I would imagine most of you probably had COVID, I would suspect. And now that there's a, a vaccine that even if you get it, you can still get and transmit COVID. So the vaccine mandate just, often for a lot of people, if you're looking at it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Lisa. I work in acute care in a hospital. Um, I feel like the 18 months have been a total roller coaster ride. Um, I mean, there was a period at the beginning where you were hearing instructions and precautions to take one hour were different than the next hour, were different than the next afternoon, was different than the next day because nobody really knew. And yes, it was something new. I mean, it was a learning curve for everybody. And having to use protective equipment and gear with our COVID patients, you know, things are not like they used to be. I mean, wearing the same one multiple times, which is not a safe thing. You know, but that's what they were saying we had to do at that time. Um, there's been periods where I was on furlough for three months because, or three weeks because we didn't have enough patients at the beginning. And now we're like running ragged. And it's like that up and down. There was a period where I was shifted to another hospital campus for three and a half months, not by choice, but it ended up being a good opportunity, but it's just like lack of choice, lack of input, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that kind of thing. And it just seems like everything's really out of control. It's yeah. like, and I'm starting to feel like I hear a ton of people in today's world saying hospitals are full of COVID patients. Well, we're full. We're not full of COVID patients. Hmm. We're full because we don't have enough staff and we have fewer beds that way. And yes, there are some COVID patients, but that's not the majority hmm. of our population. So it's, it's really been a ragged year and a half. I think a lot of people forget about that. I did too. The last spring, it was, there was really very few people going into the medical facilities and they stopped elective surgeries. Right. And um, there were a bunch of layoffs all across the state. I've forgotten yes. all about that. And that's yeah. one of the reasons we're still chaotic and you're catching up on orthopedic surgeries and things that weren't addressed for a while. And then people that were afraid to come to the hospital unless they were on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. So you're making up for all that. So we're busier than we've ever been. Yeah. But we're also shorter staffed. And 
if they continue with this mandate, we're going to be even shorter staffed right. down the road. Well, and what do you guys think is going to happen when these people who avoided the hospital out of fear of COVID for a year start building their confidence back up? I'm assuming there's going to be a, a greater surge on the, on the system and, and well, potentially fewer people. Fewer staff members. Right staff, yeah. Yeah. Fewer beds. Great. Well, boy, that's, again, a lot of the stuff you don't hear, you know, from the mainstream media. You just, you never see it. But, you know, touring the, the state for the last couple of weeks and just meeting with a lot of different people in the healthcare industry, it became obvious that there is a lot to get out there. So, again, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, so, another question, kind of move on here, is what, what are, like, the truths that you guys see every day when you're in the field that you just never hear the media talk about that frustrate you. Yeah, Tisha. So I, I kind of had a similar experience. I was working in dermatology. I got shipped out. I worked in the acute respiratory clinic that we had set up for strict COVID patients. We were diverting those patients to a distinct clinic. Um, and then I worked in the swab tents for three months. And then I wasn't allowed to go back to my department because I was plagued. Can't go back. So I stayed working in the swab tents for an additional month or two. And in the meantime, I also worked for the Minnesota Emergency Operations, where I could go from long-term to long-term to long-term. So I worked in Hibbing, I worked, I worked everywhere. Um, and a lot of what I saw was you would go into these facilities and they're full of COVID. And you know, some were sick, some weren't. They're all old. <laughs> um, but you would go in and you're throwing on PPE that you can smell through. It's obviously not working. And as an RN, I'm working as an aide. Well, because there's only one other RN to 45 patients. You have patients on hospice. There's no aides to take care of them. They're dying alone. I don't honestly think all of these people died from COVID. They died from loneliness. And, yeah, and other conditions. So, I mean, you're sitting in there trying to give comfort cares as you're trying to rotate 25 other patients, and there's two of you. And all the other staff are off because they're positive for COVID, but they're asymptomatic, but they can't work in a fully COVID unit. Right. So, it was just a lot of, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. And a roller coaster. <laughs> Yeah, the roller coaster seems to be the theme for sure. What what other truths do you guys see when you're in there and you, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just take it since I'm right next to it. Um, the thing that has bothered me the most through this entire pandemic is there's been no push for taking care of yourself, um, healthy diet, healthy living, um, hydration, sleep habits, you know, mental health, all that kind of stuff. There's been no push for that. It's only a push for vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. It's like in order for us as nurses, our, we're holistic healers. So we're mind, body, spirit. That's what we're taught. That's what we do. And to, for us to not really be able to focus on that piece of our practice, it's been frustrating. And then people don't listen to you if you don't talk about the vaccine. It's like they shun you off like you're anti-vax. No, I'm not. But you have to do these things to build up your immune system too. Right. Yeah. It's amazing how they shut down churches, but then they said liquor stores can stay open and, and you can go, you know, get whatever fast food you want. And gyms are closed yeah. though. It was just, there's no common sense. We'll go around circle. <laughs> What's really frustrated me is the hypocrisy. It's, it's rampant. Um, at Heart Facility, we also have a long-term care center, and the, they weren't even wearing masks at all in the beginning, and they went to homemade cloth masks that were gaping around yeah. the sides of the mouth. The nurses taking care of the COVID patients were wearing N95 respirators, which they need to be fit tested for. And if you can smell any of that sugar spray, you got to wear the, the hood and the mm -hmm. fan. And, but yet all of us, uh, the rest of us are, are supposed to wear surgical masks. Is that preventative? Is that helpful? Then the long-term care staff are wearing cloth masks and they're with the most vulnerable population. Right. And like you said, we're not hearing about the health measures, vitamin D, zinc. We're not hearing about getting enough sleep, getting fresh air, opening your windows. Instead, people are driving in their convertibles with their masks on. Right, right. It's right. ridiculous. <laughs> and then what about treatment? I mean, the COVID treatment. We don't even really have any COVID treatment in some places. 
the, it's, it's, you know, well, you're here, and when you stop breathing, we'll put you on a ventilator, but, um, you know, there's not a whole lot that we can do. And we know that that's not true. Why is there not more panels and research studies on how can we help people? But the hypocrisy really breaks down the trust in healthcare workers, and healthcare workers are starting to not trust the authorities right. and the people. I mean, it's just a vicious circle, and like you said, the focus is purely on the vaccine, and there's something really wrong with that. Right. Yeah, when, when Governor Wall said the Boundary Waters are closed, I had to cancel a trip to the Boundary Waters. I said, it's too dangerous, you need to isolate. I thought, this is a million acre forest, I think I'll be okay out there. Those bears, they start going. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I think one of the most frustrating things for me has been the um, lack of transparency with the numbers of COVID in the hospital. The Minnesota Department of Health is um, reporting these numbers as if these numbers are people in the hospital for COVID, but every patient is tested when they're admitted to the hospital, unless they refuse. Mm. Um, and they're not in there for that. They might be in there for a car accident or kidney disease or cancer, but they happen to have COVID so asymptomatically. Let me, let me try to explain that again or make sure I paraphrase it. I break my leg, I go to the hospital, they test me for COVID, and the Minnesota Department of Health is going to say that's a COVID patient in the hospital? Yes. <laughs> so they'll, oh my God. so you might be in there because you broke your leg because you need surgery so you have to stay overnight. Well, for the OR you need a COVID test. To be admitted you need a COVID test. We test you, you have no symptoms, you're positive. Now that number is being used to skew other things, to put more fear into people, to mask our kids at school, to close businesses down that are not causing any harm or super spreading as the Minnesota Department of Health and John Malcolm would like you to think. So. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. So the biggest truth for me that doesn't come out in the media that's the most frustrating is the fact that they keep saying that this is safe and effective. I personally have over a dozen friends and family that have had reactions. Um, my brother-in-law died from the vaccination. I, I, my niece and nephews don't have a dad anymore. And you know, everyone else that I know that has had a reaction to this, they continue to suffer today from having biopsies to surgical procedures to, you know, you name it. I mean, they've, they've gone to doctors, you know, they have two weeks off of vacation and they have to go three, four, five doctors. Yeah. And, you know, the media is still saying that this is safe and effective, and it's just not true. I mean, if you talk about the VAERS number, they sit there and tell you, oh, no, no, no. I mean, the, these, these have not been studied. But every other vaccination, that has been the gold standard that they have used. So why now is it different? Yeah, yeah. Why now is it not a good system? I, I, was, I want to hit on that because I was talking to a nurse in... Uh, uh, well, I don't say where because so many people are concerned about, you know, their own safety. So, but I was talking to a nurse just last week and she said her supervisor is discouraging her to uh, report adverse reactions to the VAERS database um, as it relates to COVID vaccines. And I'm kind of, kind of curious, this is maybe a loaded question, but has anybody else felt the pressure from anybody to not? Re no? Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So I think there's more than what is being reported. That's just a personal interpretation, guesstimate with it. But for and a lot of this being reported, reported is false. You know, like when we first started having COVID patients, they would come in, we test them, they're COVID positive. They go into the, they come in like with a car broken act, broken ankle, messed up from a car accident, and they go in to stay as inpatient. Well, at first it was every 72 hours you have to test them. Mm -hmm. So they come in on, like let's say October 1st, and they test positive. And 72 hours later, we're going to come in and do a washout but it's been 72 hours, so they gotta get tested again. So now that same person is being submitted on a different day as another positive, but it's the same person. Right. If they're in the hospital for three months, they're getting tested every three days. Right. That's 30 positive tests for one person that's being submitted as 30 new cases. Right. And they're not telling people that. Well, and I saw something, uh, and I've heard from several people that the VAERS database, it is, it's known it's very underreported. I think yes. they've said that it's like 1% of adverse reactions get reported to VAERS. Yeah. Sorry, I that's okay. um, with, I just wanted, yeah, you were going back to the various reporting because, so I have um, a different situation because I haven't been at the bedside since last October. And so I've been able to be more vocal about things on Facebook and social media. And 
Um, out of that, I've had lots of my previous coworkers and friends of mine who are nurses who have reached out to me personally and told me all sorts of insane stories. Hmm. Um, because they're afraid to speak up. They're afraid of the repercussions, they're afraid of the bullying, the harassment, um, and a lot of what I've heard about the VAERS numbers is that when that they're seeing more reactions with their patients post-vaccination than they're seeing COVID patients. Hmm. Um, and, and not only that, when they bring it up to the physicians, they, they're not only like, you know, poo-pooed or, you know, anything like that, they're called anti-vaxxers, hmm. they're laughed at, for bringing it up, like the, they're, they make the nurse feel like they're stupid. Right. For even considering, they're, they're not even considering that it could be related at all. Um, there have been physicians who have said that it's because of Minnesota's extreme heat. That's why we're seeing upticks in things like stroke and heart attack. Um, <laughs> it's from the extreme heat. I didn't know that heat stroke could cause <laughs> real stroke, but you know, when I was or hemorrhagic stroke, right? Even, even more, um, you know, and so, and there's just like such an insane sense of bullying that's going on that people aren't even wanting to speak of. And the thing that people don't realize is that most medical professionals, um, you know, nurses, don't even didn't even know about bears until all this came about. Mm -hmm. We're not taught about bears. No, in nursing no. School. Oh wow. Um, that came about in my own research when I had my own kids and I started to look into vaccines myself. Um, and so. If you look on the VAERS website, it says that medical professionals are mandated to report a whole list of side effects for all different kinds of vaccine reactions. We were just on a call with the only infectious disease doctor at the hospital um, that I previously worked <coughs> at, and he was saying that VAERS is all self-reported. Oh. So the, the numbers are inflated because they, it is self-reported, which is absolute BS. Because yeah. it says straight on the website that you as medical professionals are mandated to report this whole list, and then there's another whole list that you're encouraged to report. Hmm. But those are not being reported, and the nurses are being discouraged from reporting it because, first of all, it takes about 30 minutes to report on theirs. Mm -hmm. So my concern, and where people are like, oh, these are not, you know, um, verified numbers, all this stuff, whoever put in all of those various requ requests had enough concern to spend 30 minutes to put that in amongst having to do all of these other jobs, especially right. you know, if they're working in healthcare, they had to take 30 minutes out of their day to put that in and risk people walking by, seeing them doing this and belittling them and um, judging them for it and all of these things or doing it on their own time. And so I would say that the VAERS report, you know, holds a lot of clout because whoever put that in took the time to put it in despite all of the discouragement to be done. Right, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I just wanted to touch base on a few of those things because about the adverse reactions. So I'm a triage nurse and so people will call with like concerns of whether it be from COVID directly or the vaccine and I feel like a lot of people from their doctors are getting discouraged or invalidated almost um, to say that those symptoms are specific to the vaccine or from the vaccine I should say. Um, and then as far as transparency goes, um, we were also at one point reporting positive COVID cases of people that were vaccinated. And I feel like, I don't know, it must have been two, three short weeks later, mass email that said, we don't want to know anymore whether they're vaccinated or not. So really? I don't know, red flags, like why don't you want to know whether this vaccine is working or not? Because clearly it's not, so. Wow, that's interesting. So I, I have a constituent here in Shakopee who, um, she's a healthcare worker and uh, was told get this vaccine or else and so she went and got it and uh, I talked to her husband a week ago and he said within 48 hours she was in the hospital with blood clots and they've since amputated both legs from above knee one hand and three fingers from the other from the other hand yeah Tisha So you'll have to excuse my cough. I'm getting over bronchitis. Believe me, it does exist. It's not COVID, it's bronchitis. Getting over it. Um, but I also work telephone triage now. Um, and I hear the weirdest side effects. I used to work up north as an immunization coordinator. Your standard vaccines. I, you know, fever, some chills, fatigue. Okay, go to bed, take some Tylenol, you'll be fine. The side effects are 
I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this. You have lymph nodes swelling in your chest and in your neck and in your armpit and your foot's hurt and I, I don't know what to do. So we send him to the emergency department and then it gets written off and I don't know what happens with the Ferris report. Hmm. Um, but we, uh, some of us nurses did write to our CEO about the mandated. Um, and what he had to say about VARES was very interesting. Um, I commented on the death number. He said, the death number is wrong, but most importantly, the data is related to death after they received the vaccine. In other words, the vaccine didn't cause the death, but was given in a time frame where death was reported. Wow. <laughs> so when everybody dies from COVID, if they die, if they're already in hospital, yeah. and they're gonna die in the next few weeks anyway, yeah. and they just happen to contract COVID, they didn't die from what they're in hospice for, they died from COVID. Yeah. But if you get a vaccine and you just happen to die, oh, it's something else. Right, yeah. right. It's something yeah. else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that that's what we're yep. interpreting there. That's, yeah. yeah. And nobody, nobody is sitting here you know, on this pedestal saying that all these various reports are exactly accurate and all this stuff. We All we're asking for is transparency that it's actually happening and it's being reported and asking people to look into it, asking the appropriate people to look into it. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. They're, yeah, you were gonna ask me. Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. I think just listening to people talk, how come nobody's asking the nurses why they don't want it? Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Why don't that, that you want be, it? That should be a <laughs> huge, huge red flag. That should be a huge flag. Yeah. Why is nobody asking these questions? Because you have healthcare systems that have very minimal people vaccinated. They want to tell you that they're fully vaccinated, they are not. There is departments with 20% vaccinated. Hmm. ER departments are very low. Why? Why, people? We are seeing it, and they're not listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, let's ask that question. For people who have said, I don't want the vaccine, you've made that choice. And I, I can tell you, I've made that choice because I've looked at the data, mm -hmm. and I've determined this doesn't pose a risk for me. I actually had COVID already, so uh, I've got natural immunity, but why don't you guys want? Well, I'm an ER nurse, and I see the... The, all of the strokes, the heart attacks. I mean, it is blatantly obvious what they are causing. Blatantly obvious. And with the VAERS reports and they're not wanting to report it, it's so disheartening. But I have to say, in my department, I have educated a lot of my staff, yeah. <laughs> and they are all staying after work reporting. Nice, good, yeah. <laughs> so um, I might be kind of uh, in a a little bit of a different class than most of the folks here. I have a tremendous amount of respect for nurses and providers who are right on the front line, tip of the spear. I'm a nerd on the back end. I work for a healthcare company in the Twin Cities Metro here, actually a uh, pretty large one. And I work in IT and it's my job to, you know, um, I'm a systems analyst, I process data. It's my job to objectively look at data, assess things, help, take raw data and turn it into useful information for business stuff. But I, you know, I have a little work uh, that relates to healthcare, but n not nearly as much as the rest of you. <clears throat> what's uh, really getting under my skin is uh, what seems to be a very alarming trend of argument from authority and the wiggling around on terms. You know, I, there's a saying that says, he who controls the vocabulary controls the debate, right? I can tell you, I know that's absolutely true from the world I've been doing. I've been at this company for 17 years, you know? Um, if I were an unscrupulous person and not an objective scientific type, you could come to me and say, take these raw numbers and make them look like we're doing great, financially or something. It's, if you have the right skills to bend things and change the terms and influence people to perceive the data certain ways, you can really kind of paint any picture you want. Now, I mean, I, I find that horribly unethical. I would never do that myself, but I'm just stating that it's not hard to do. Um, so, you know, um, personally, I've encountered uh, a fair amount of friction due to my personal resistance to um, leaping into having what I would describe as faith towards the safety of the vaccine. Now, I never, I never leap into any decision uh, because it just, it's my impulse. I'm wired to dive into the data and do analysis of it. When I bought my house, I, I looked at like 40,000 40, different factors, right? When most, some people just walk up and they buy it and they're fine with it. No. Uh, if I'm going to put something in my system that could theoretically be with me forever, I'm going to do a lot of reading. And I look at this stuff objectively and I see there's plenty of stuff. And I'm from the outside. I'm not seeing patients. 
plenty of stuff from people who I think, you know, they, 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 you know, they have uh, demonstrated a history of being trustworthy uh, in their careers. They're throwing red flags and sounding the alarm going, hey, why aren't we asking about this? Why aren't we looking at this? Why are we, it seems like we're purposely ignoring segments of the data. Why are we discounting the firsthand feedback of certain individuals in the field? Um, you know, uh, why, why is it only the CDC's opinion is sufficient and blessed? Um, I, in my day-to-day -day experience too, I feel like what I'm observing is there's also pressure, and I, and I have a lot of sympathy for people higher up in healthcare, because I think they're under tremendous pressure to basically prevent panic, prevent, uh, th they think they have a role in basically quelling fear so that people don't just unravel and we have unrest or something. So there's a, I think there's pressure on them to um, dabble in noble lying a little bit, you know, like uh, creating these half-truth uh, managing perceptions. Hmm. Right. You know, well, that's sort of natural curiosity, since this is a brand new type of vaccine, um, and having some hesitancy since we don't know the long-term effects. I don't think punishing people for having some curiosity and wanting to see what's going to happen in the longer term is appropriate at all, and I'm assuming that's why a lot of you guys are here. You feel the same way. So to kind of wrap up, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Um, I was given the ultimatum. I said, they say, well, listen, you know, we've decided it's in, it's in our and the community's best interest that all of our staff are going to get the backs. I said, you know, uh, number one, uh, can I get an exception? Maybe because I, I work from home in my basement 24-7. <laughs> I don't go into the office. You've been self-quarantining for uh, a long time. I feel like, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, I, I'm willing, I'd like to be part of the team, but I mean, I don't feel like I'm a very high risk to the, to the patients, right? No, nope, sorry, everybody. So. You know, that's, that's a red flag to me too. You know, like, why is it so important? Why can't there be more, you know, review over certain classification cases for people? Well, I want to kind of shift gears. You want to answer that real quick? I don't want to pull a rug on you. just talking about in response to your comment yeah. about why aren't they, we asking nurses why. Yeah. And it seems like we have two choices, a religious exemption why does your religion prevent you from getting COVID is the direct question on my exemption board. Right. The second one is, what medical condition do you have that prevents you from getting the COVID vaccination? That's it. We That's all we have. Opinion. We can't have any other opinion. Yeah. I got something to add to that just quick. Yeah. Our CEO, and I'm not going to say which hospital I'm at, okay? Yep. Our CEO of our hospital, our president, told us on one day, you can get a medical or religious exemption, that they will be allowing for that. The details will come out next month in September, which is they're waiting for FDA approval, so we can't use that. Two days later, we get an email, and it's an email that gets sent out every Thursday night for Friday morning employees to see. And you had to scroll down to find this. Guidance for exemption requests from patients. As employers, our community are, requ are increasingly requiring COVID-19 vaccination for their employees, including our organization. We expect to see an increase in patients seeking vaccination exemption letters. We have recommended against our clinicians from providing medical exemptions, including pregnancy, unless the patient has a documented allergy to a specific ingredient. How, who the hell does the president think she is to turn around and tell my provider behind closed doors how they can or cannot treat us? Well, that's what I've been hearing from a lot of people. Yeah, yeah please. That's, I think there should be one exemption, and that's personal freedom. You know, you should have the ability to decide what goes in your body or not. But. Oh, I printed out from right from the, the website from Connernati. Does this affect pregnant people? We don't know. The studies are not yet. Does this cause this? We don't know. The studies are not yet. I have it all printed out right here. They don't know. Right. They don't know, and they're telling us in the insert. But the insert, honest to God, I was on the internet for like two hours this afternoon, and I didn't even get through halfway through the pamphlet on what we're supposed to read for informed consent. And they're wanting you to walk in and get jabbed, and it took me two hours, and I didn't even get through the entire pamphlet of informed yeah, consent. Yeah, uh, that's what I want to talk about next, because that is one of the hottest things that... Uh, that got brought up when we were, you know, t touch, reaching out to everybody and saying, what, what, what do you want to talk about? What do you think the world needs to know? And informed consent was brought up by a ton of you guys. So I want to ask that question. When it comes to informed consent, oh, there's a hand that shot up right in the back right there. <laughs> um, when it comes to informed consent, you know, what's lacking? Where are we falling short of proper informed consent? And 
of uh, Samantha back there is dying to tell us. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the biggest issue, okay? This is the biggest issue, and this is why every medical professional should be pissed off right now. Because we all know that informed consent has been dying for years, um, that there's not enough time to give true informed consent in most situations for a lot of things in healthcare. Um, I'm an OB nurse by background, and I left my previous job to um, create my own birth classes called Birth Like a Boss that is all about informed consent in birth. Um, so informed consent includes a lot of things, one of them being the right to refuse. It is, a, it is a patient right to refuse any procedure. Any procedure, any treatment, um, they have the right to refuse. We are taught that in nursing school up and down that they have the right to refuse. I, as a medical professional, can provide information. I can give risk versus benefit, and I can talk about alternatives and also their risk versus benefit, okay? I can even disagree with them and I can document that I educated them and they still refused, but I do not get to tell them what they can and cannot do. Right. Mm -hmm. I only can say that they refused despite education about the risks and benefits, that I have explained the risks to them, I explained the benefits to them, and they still made that informed, a choice, informed choice on their own. Because the thing about informed consent, and that I tell all of my clients, because um, this comes in a, a lot when you're talking about kids, and I know a lot of us are here, not because, not just because we ourselves are be are at stake with this, but we know it's not going to stop in healthcare. We also know that our kids, we there was a um, meme on Facebook, you know, um, but it was really, really powerful of how we are doing this because we are standing in front of our kids. We're standing in front of what is coming up for our kids. Um, so when it relates to informed consent, I tell my clients that it doesn't matter who you're talking to as an expert, it doesn't matter how much education they have, um, how much they know about that, they will never know what is best for you and for your children. Yes. Because they also will never get to live with the consequences of your choices. Whatever choice you make as a person and as a parent, you live with whatever consequences those are for your children. That doctor does not parent your children, that doctor does not see what happens to your children out of the decisions that you make. So um, that is why informed consent is incredibly, incredibly important, and it is not happening. So anyone to add to that? Where, where are we falling short it, when it comes to informed consent? Oh, everybody's dying to talk about this one. I think what makes a lot of us mad is it's, it's part of our code of ethics of nurses. It's, we have to give our patients informed consent. So why can't we have informed consent? Why don't we get that option to choose whether or not what we're putting into our body? And I think that's what really, really makes most of us angry. There's a provision in the Code of Ethics for Nursing about protection of human participants and research, specifically. So we need to make sure we're giving informed consent, proper informed consent to all people for this vaccine to understand you can get it, you don't need to get it, but I'm not going to make that choice for you, but I want to make sure you have all of the information, not just right. what you're hearing in mainstream media. And nurses are taught to critically think, and that's why a lot of us haven't gotten a vaccine yet, because we're critically thinking and, and observing. So how does that look? So you, you, you're, someone's deciding whether they want the, the vaccine, and it's, your, your role is to give them the information they need to make a decision. And I'm kind of going into the weeds on this, but how does that look? Is there a pamphlet? I mean, what, what do you give them so they know They've got information, nothing? Um, it's like a small one page, couple page printout um, of kind of, it goes through possible side effects, um, what the intention of the vaccine is, um, possible boosters will be needed. <laughs> can I ask, sorry, all the hands are going up right now if you can't see, but um, so this constituent of mine that, that has amputations because of this, the doctor told um, her husband that they think that she had COVID, like contracted it as soon as she was getting the vaccination. And he said, boy, you, you shouldn't, he said, you shouldn't get the vaccination if you've had COVID. And the, the constituent is saying, he's not anti-vax, he's just saying, why aren't yeah. people saying you shouldn't get this vaccine if you have COVID? They, why did they test her for COVID before they stuck the needle in her? Well, on the sheet, because I actually worked giving the vaccine as well, and there is a informed consent sheet that people fill out online, and it's just a quick one-page thing, um, and they do it on their own. There's not a healthcare provider with them, gotcha. but then when they come in to get the vaccine, then we're supposed to go through it with them, and I know not everybody goes through it like I do with them. Gotcha. And so um, on there, it does say, have you had these symptoms in the last 
two weeks, have you tested okay. positive for COVID in the last two weeks? But if it's beyond 14 days of a positive COVID, you are okay to get the vaccine. Okay, One thing I just want to interject real quick, though, with the vaccine stuff. So what she's talking about is a vaccine information sheet, the CIS mm -hmm. that is created. Mm -hmm. Vaccines are the only thing that has a sheet created of what the CDC wants you to know about this for informed consent. They do not give out package inserts for vaccines. They give out a vaccine information sheet that is cherry-picked information for you. So just FYI. And that's different from other vaccines? Does that look thin? Does that look like no. somebody who yeah. is a non-medical professional can interpret and understand, even if they do have somebody explaining it to them? Does that look like something that the average person is not a medical professional? And to add, so you get a pharmaceutical from a pharmacy, yes. and you get your packet with all of your meds on it, and all of those sheets oh, that sure. go through yep. all of the yeah, we've all seen that. package insert. They don't give out package inserts for vaccines. They give Interesting. Out okay. Sheets. And to add to it, Amongst what the media publicizes and what you hear through non-medical professionals, what the general population knows, all they hear is you need the vaccine, you need the vaccine or you're going to die. They don't ever hear, well, you have a side effect or the risk of increased blood clots. You have a risk of increased strokes. You have an increased risk of increased inflama inflammation and decreased immune system factor. Never would our media publicize the negative side effects that the vaccine can have. I mean, I know a coworker whose brother died from the vaccine because he had the vaccine or had COVID when he got the vaccine, but didn't know it. I know somebody whose mom had a massive stroke four days after getting it. I know a person myself who she put on her Facebook page, I got the COVID, I ended up, how did I get COVID? I got the vaccine, but yesterday I ended up in the hospital with a blood clot in my leg and more breathing difficulties with a pulmonary embolism. And it's like, how did, she's like, how did this happen? And she works in a medical career herself because I got the vaccine. So people are in total denial just because of what the media and what the government is telling them. Yeah. Yeah, they do, yeah. they do. And nothing, no, there are very limited sites that people have access to which show how dangerous this is. And the research studies that have been proven that this is an increased risk of these health conditions and this is not a safe thing. So it's really tough with, with the public media and general population because they don't have access to this. Because so their brains are pretty much being warped. Yeah, and they're kept in fear too. I, yes. I, can, I can't even tell you how many you talked about. Let's go to Dolores here. Her hand's getting tired, it's falling <laughs> down. <laughs> well, I just know um, of a death certificate of a son of a, one of my classmates who was 25, very physically fit, had his physicals, good health, got the shot, died. His death certificate came back. His father knows it was the COVID vaccine, told, told them, this is the only thing that has changed. It came back as undetermined cause of death. Uh -huh. Nothing else, undetermined. Mm -hmm. How is that right? How is that right? And we'll shoot back here. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of the problem is the stuff that's going on behind closed doors that we don't see. So we can all attest to what we're seeing with our eyes, but there is so much going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. For example, I'm a nurse and I'm an educator, so I'm privy to a lot, of, a lot of complaints from students recently that are going to be dismissed from their programs because the Minnesota Board of Nursing has required that they um, attend an insight clinical if it is offered, and if that site requires that they be vaccinated against their will, then they have no choice but to drop the program. So stuff that they've worked long and hard for, it doesn't matter. And unfortunately, many of the educators, which I feel terrible about doing this because I have a lot of respect for them, but the, the actions behind closed doors is disgusting. Um, the comments that I heard in some of our meetings were they're killing patients if they don't get this vaccine. They're just ignorant and we don't want nurses like that. Uh, we need to make the exemption process as hard as we can for them. And then, uh, good luck finding a new career, and they all snickered. That is the disgusting stuff that is going on behind closed doors that nobody hears and nobody knows about. And these are people that are sending out people into the world and they're you know, projecting their bias on the people that they think are gonna be good nurses because they believe the same crap that, that they believe. And that is just wrong. We need to find out what is happening at these CEO meetings for the hospitals where they're deciding the fate for everyone else. Where's, is there some type of exchange going on that we don't know about? Because we all see the frontline stuff. What's the back line? Yeah, a question for you guys. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but you guys have kind of 
touched on this. I know I'm dying to ask you guys this question. I think a lot of people <laughs> at home are dying to ask this question because there's the controversy right now is, is who's continuing to get sick, whether it's the, the Delta or the Alpha, but who is, and if you're able to comment on it, um, who's getting sick? Is it the vaccinated? Is it the unvaccinated? Uh, what, do you guys have takes on this? Does anybody? Don't tell us. You don't know, okay. You don't know, and, and the comments, like I work in surgery and I can tell you, people come in and they'll go, what's their vaccination status? Because you can look at their the history. And part of, right, and part of our timeout is been added whether or not their, what their COVID status is. And if they say their COVID status, we don't know or we're waiting on it, and it comes back, oh, pff, of course they're not vaccinated. Right. It's, uh -huh. That's patient abuse. Yeah. So they're assuming they're, they're not assuming, vaccinated. Well, no, it'll say in their chart when it comes back. Oh. So if somebody comes <coughs> into the ER and they need surgery or somebody's having issues and they need surgery, gallbladder, whatever, mm -hmm. and we got to sit and wait and it's like, well, if they would have just got vaccinated, it would be in there and they'd be up here by now. And sometimes it'll come back and be like, oh my God, this person isn't even vaccinated. Oh, of course not. They're one of them. To me, that's patient abuse. Mm -hmm. That is patient abuse. And a lot of times that conversation takes place after the patient is asleep in the room. That's a vulnerable adult on the table. And you are talking ill of them. Hmm. Would you want to be that patient with those people who are the pro-vaxxers for this vaccination sitting there belittling you while you're a vulnerable adult? I want to say I've been in surgery multiple times and I have heard what's said in the room and on me. I can repeat the discussion between the anesthesiologist and the surgeon about how my appendix looked like a uh, night crawler and they were going to go fishing on the weekend. Huh. <laughs> wow. And they thought I didn't hear. I think what's really hard is for so many of us we have to advocate. We advocate for our patients every day, whether their choices are what we would choose for ourselves, for our loved ones. If they want to do a surgery that's really risky and we think, wow, I don't think I'd put my family member through that, it's still our job to advocate for them. And when you hear other medical professionals who will not advocate for someone's choices, even to vaccinate or not, and they will say things like, oh, they shouldn't get care if they get COVID then, or we shouldn't even take care of them if they get COVID because they're choosing to be not vaccinated. It's not our job to choose who comes through our doors or what brought them there. I take care of you to the best ability I can, whether you're Mother Teresa or you came from the prison. It's not my job to make the decisions for you that landed you in my hospital. And most of our patients are in the hospital because of their life choices. It makes you not trust other medical professionals. Yeah. Well, let's kind of head on that a little bit. So you guys are, you're in a scientific field, right? And we've got a self-professed data guy right here. Data geek, I think you call yourself a geek. My wife does the same thing, she's in IT too. Uh, hi, honey, <laughs> if she's watching. Um, are we using science and data? No. 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 We're being silenced, okay. no. they're using the evidence. We're being silenced. You go on Facebook and put anything, you're in Facebook jail for a month, you can't yeah. post. Yeah. You go on Twitter yeah. and post anything, you, do, you get in trouble and you get kicked off of Twitter. And I just want to bring up a legal thing that I want everybody to know because in nursing we are taught about intentional crimes and torts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and that's what you're speaking to with informed consent. Yeah. Okay, it says an intentional tort is assault and battery. Assault yes. is the threat of an unwanted action or bodily contact. Yeah. Battery is an assault that is carried out and includes willful, angry, violent, negligent touching of another person's body, clothing, or anything attached to them forcibly removing patient's clothing and administering an injection after patient has refused it are all examples of battery. This is out of my nursing book from four years ago. This is what they teach us. If we did this to a patient, if you told your patient informed consent and they said no and you did it anyway, yep. you would go to jail, you'd yep. get your nursing license yep. taken yep. away, and you'd be a criminal. Absolutely. So now what they're doing is they're putting us in the position of saying either you become a victim of a crime voluntarily and the nurse giving the injection when they know you don't want it is committing a crime. That nurse can lose their license and we're being told to be a victim of a crime in order to keep our employment. I understand conditions of employment. I understand there's certain things you do and don't have to do, but nobody should have to become a victim of a crime that could result in somebody going to jail and losing their medical license in order to keep our job. Yeah, that's great, that is great. Yeah, your employer doesn't have the freedom to do whatever they want to your body. You, they can't have a policy that says, well, we're going to slap you in the face every time you walk in the door. That, 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 that's, you can't do that. To top it off, when people are having significant major side effects, whether it's a stroke, whether it's more respiratory issues, whatever is a long-term health condition, there's nobody confessing to it. It's not like they can sue the company who established the vaccine. No, they're free. They're clear. They're very well not 
being held liable for it. Right. The government is not taking responsibility. Nobody is taking responsibility, but it's their fault. They're just throwing it at us, and that's all that matters right. to them. It's really sad. And that plays to a question one of my coworkers gave me and said, please bring it down because she couldn't be here. Her question is, who is going to be responsible if I'm vaccinated? Who's going to take care of my children when I have side effects? Not if, when. Who's going to take care of my finances? Who's going to feed my dogs and cats? And I have the same question. Who's going to take care of my family? I've got a mortgage I have to pay. Who's going to pay my mortgage if I can't? Is this a workman's comp issue? Where does it fall? OSHA says OSHA it is. Says it was. OSHA yes. says it is. Yeah, that's just. And then, like, within 24 hours, it was rescinded. Oh, they rescinded it already? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just heard about it today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Within, like, 24 hours, they must have got a word from somewhere else. <laughs> I just wanted to say something about the mandates again. Um, I really believe this is a terrible, slippery slope. Um, we're, I'm, I'm one and a half years from retirement. I'm a nurse educator, I have two master's degrees. I'm very, I, I'm, they need me at my hospital. The nurses need me, the patients need me. Without good education, you know, I mean, it's, it's a requirement. But uh, if I don't get the vaccine, I'm gonna lose my job. I'm gonna lose thousands of dollars in retirement. I'm gonna lose my health insurance, my life insurance, my over 400 days of extended illness bank hours. I'm gonna lose a lot. But I'm here because I believe in medical freedom. And I believe that if we don't stand up and stop these mandates, they're gonna keep twisting our arm and twisting our arm and twisting our arm until we're all broken. And the system can't handle it. The crisis is bad now, staffing is bad now. We haven't seen anything yet. And an unvaccinated nurse is way better than no nurse. Right, right. Well, as we're kind of wrapping up here, we're pushing about an hour. Um, I just, kind of the last question is final thoughts. Is anybody sitting on something where you're like, man, he didn't ask about this thing, and I really wish you would have asked about this thing. Here's your chance. You know, one thing, and I have a slightly different perspective. Even though I work in acute care in a hospital in a traditional career, I personally believe in alternative medicine a whole lot more. If I was in my 20s, that's what I'd go into now. But I feel like all of the so-called MD COVID treatments is treat the symptoms, give a drug that the government is saying to give, even if it won't help, and don't even think of some of these supplements. Don't even think of these healthy side effects that you guys were mentioning, or healthy lifestyle things that you were mentioning. You know, whether you're using different um, supplements, certain prescriptions that aren't specifically okayed by the government necessarily. If you're not, the doctors don't get it. All they want to do is what the government is telling them, use, you know, use ventilators, use specific drugs. Let's treat symptoms. Symptoms are all that matter. Don't treat the problem. Hmm. And if you treat the problem, it's not profitable. Right, right. And I mean, as I said, I'm opinionated on traditional versus alternative medicine, but at the same time, this is a, a pandemic. I mean, people are dying from this. They do, not everybody, but people do die. And you need to treat the whole thing, not just the symptoms. And you know, if you're gonna treat the symptoms, we're gonna keep having more types of COVID. And it's gonna keep changing with the strains. And people are gonna keep getting sick. Some will die, many won't. But it's just not an appropriate approach that MDs are using. Hmm. Interesting. I wanna say something that I thought of when, when uh, you mentioned about the, the things whispered behind closed doors. Um, there's another group of people, I think, uh, that aren't necessarily obvious in that camp, and that's people like us who are uh, not comfortable speaking up, you know? Um, at my work, when this came out, and I said, you know, I made it, whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, my instinct was to speak up, throw it out there, this is not okay, I, I, I cannot, I can't support this, I can't go along with this. Right after I did that, I got like 10 supportive emails from coworkers, like right away. Yeah. And they were like, wow, I wish I could do that, but I'm not in a situation where I can. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you look in this room, there's what, 40, 50 people here. Every one of you represents 10 or 20, yes. you know? Yeah. And they're sitting there, they're, they're, they don't feel ready or comfortable. They think they're alone. They don't understand the power they have to, yeah. they gotta raise their voice. That's, the, that's so important, you gotta raise your voice right now. Courage is contagious. I totally agree. So, um, 
Eric mentioned some final thoughts, and uh, I, I want to take this in kind of a somewhat different direction a little bit. I, I wrote this thing ahead of time because I'm not, uh, well, I uh, need more experience with the public speaking. It's been quite a while. So, but um, we have to speak the truth, even if your voice shakes, as the saying goes. Um, I'm Christina Scott. Some of you might remember me or know me or know of me um, for my incessant criticism of um, the CDC, Governor Waltz, and um, the Minnesota Department of Health, all of whom have been totally complicit in all of this. Um, so I'm, I'm in public health. Um, I've been in the field for 13 years. I studied um, public health, um, pursuing my master's degree um, in, of science um, at George Washington University. Uh, I, it was distance learning, so of course it was horrible. I learned about that a long time ago. <laughs> um, so uh, Eric was asking for, for stories. So here's my story, it's a little different. Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm a, I'm a nurse like most of us here, um, but uh, I, I used to do vaccines all the time. I was, as a public health nurse, um, I was a travel medicine nurse. So I really did trust the CDC, and I would use them um, as a resource multiple times every single day. Um, and um, I, they, they lost my trust in uh, 2010, March of last year, kind of at the beginning of this pandemic. So bear with me for a moment, please, as I try to hit these points that I wrote down. Um, and I'm gonna explain why they lost my trust. Um, their statements about the virus, they do not match the science, the real science, in the medical journals. And I, I can prove that. I didn't post, or, or well, I have posted links on my Facebook page, <laughs> Facebook page, um, but uh, I didn't bring them with me. I'll provide them to Eric uh, later. I've literally got, I've done so much research. I've, I've got hundreds of pages of just links from just everything. Um, so anyways, okay, they said, not airborne. Remember that? <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah. Okay, I did research on, on the internet for eight hours, um, figure it out that it is. I'm not a doctor, um, and I'm, I'm not a scientist at the CDC. How is it that that whole building full of people, they, they couldn't figure that out? Um, right. And I'm sitting at home with two kids, and I can do it in less than a day. All right, so there, there's that. Then, um, then we don't need masks. They were saying that for a while. Well, now we do. So, um, oh, we're back to not. Then you don't. <laughs> well, I was just getting to that. I was just getting to that, actually. Uh, they're still, I, you, you'll, <laughs> they're still flip-flopping um, about everything, literally everything. And um, I just, what I find most ridiculous is, I mean, now the, the gold standard now is all the mitigation efforts, the sub efforts that didn't work before. So let's double down on what doesn't work. Okay, one mask doesn't work. How about how about two, three, five? I mean, how many masks can? Well, let's just put a bag on our heads. You know, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so then. They decided it was airborne and close contact. Therefore, Target and Walmart stay open. Everything else shuts down. Well, liquor stores, okay, sure. We get it, um, but not the playground. No playground, because it's spread by close contact. So um, if you're outside by yourself, uh, that's more dangerous. As, as Eric mentioned at the beginning, okay, then the masks were mandated. Not medical masks, okay? Cloth and commercially made masks. And they say right on there, not a medical device. Okay, well, well then why are we wearing them? Uh, also, PS, 
it has been proven that the virus itself, proven, acknowledged, well known, again, I will provide links, uh, the virus is small enough to easily pass through those masks that everybody is wearing mm -hmm. and then dropping on the ground and putting back on their faces. I mean, it's, it's, it is nuts. Okay, so two weeks, then four, then eight, now it's forever. Um, I had to see it with my own eyes, uh, the people that I love um, being hurt, I mean, just, just depressed. My kids, they're, they're different. They're not the same. Um, it got so bad in Nevada, schools had to reopen because there was such a surge in youth suicide. Mm -hmm. You don't hear about that, do you? Not really. You have to go looking for that data. Um, and you don't have to be a nurse to see that the lockdowns, the mandates, they're killing people. They're either right away or slowly. They're killing us at 10 times the rate. I'll provide that link as well. Um, so anyways, other states, other states that don't have some of these measures have had either very similar or even less rate of infection. And they're not wearing masks, so why are we? I, and then they're re, they reevaluate, though. They go back and they say, well, it didn't work, so let's not do it. Okay, so I made the connection after a while. Um, the people who are claiming uh, that it's science and basing their mandates on the science, um, those are, I hate, I hate to say it, I don't want to make it political, but they tend to be on the left. Um, so I, I did appeal to my uh, more liberal-minded friends, and I said, um, these are the studies. Kids are dying. I'm, I'm seeing people commit suicide from this. I'm seeing people overdose from depression from being isolated for months. Um, one of my liberal or you know, more far left friends uh, responded. Most people ignored me, but he didn't. He said, but if we end the mandates, people will have to pay rent. <laughs> yeah, he did, he did, he did. So um, I'm gonna try not to go on and on about this. So let me just skip right to, um, just cup, just real quick. All right, I promise. Um, okay. Does anybody, all right, okay. Why is the science being ignored? What happened to the flu? What happened to colds? What happened to everything else? What, when did they cure heart disease? I, I, I don't know, it's a miracle, I guess. So anyways, this has been driving me, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to say crazy, but it's been extremely <laughs> frustrating. And my kids, my son told me uh, one day that he's never been so depressed in his life from the distance learning. And this is a kid who has overcome a lot of issues, disabilities, frankly. And um, so anyways, I'm I'm just, I'm doing something. Um, I, I have a big group and after a while I was like, all right, enough's enough. It's time to get into the government and make those changes. Um, we need a nurse in the house, so I am running. I think we need more, we need science back. It, it, who else is going to do it? I mean, we're, I'm still going to rallies and all that stuff, but but I, I'm also running for office in um, District 49B. So, Scott that for House. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That is so cool. Because I mean, it's one thing we've all, and we've, hopefully people feel a little lighter. You got some stuff off your chest. But, um, you know, getting in the arena and doing something about it. So kudos to you, Christina. I agree. That's yes. awesome. Well, we're slightly over an hour. I want to thank you guys again for coming out. I think this was really helpful. I think the people who tuned in, and we're going to have this recorded, we're going to post it. Please share this so your stories can continue to get to uh, new ears out there. And uh, maybe we should do more of these things because I think when well, there's the thousand people that want to do it, um, I think there's a lot of folks that would love to participate. So 
Thank you again for coming out. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Exactly. Medical science, not political. Yeah, exactly. Are we done? Sorry. <laughs> okay, I don't know. It's so weird.